Leo Curse, how are you doing? Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure this is. This has been a while coming. Um, you're a YouTuber and comedian. Yeah. I'm a YouTuber and not a comedian, but I'm very funny, right? <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about Death and Massacre. Uh, yeah. We're at a place now where Israel and, I mean, right right outside yesterday, it was a bit scary, actually. Yeah. Some, and I've said it's scary and everyone's having a go at me. Why is it scary? It's just a free Palestine thing. Why is it scary? Why do you think it is scary? Because I know I think I know why it's scary. Well, the, I mean, there's a, there's a few reasons. Number one is a, it's a large bunch of angry people. Yeah. Uh, number two, there's a lot of sort of pretty savagely anti-Semitic, uh, openly pro-terror, pro-Hamas sentiments being expressed in that crowd. And also, you'd think, well, fair enough, there's some, there's some cranks in there, but they're kind of being accepted by, by, every, by everybody. And it's not just, uh, it's not a Muslim thing. There's, there's plenty of uh, sort of lefty, uh, lefty socialists, who, undoubtedly atheists in there as well. But the police and the authorities aren't really doing much about it. They're coming out with all the Met. Police came out with all these excuses as to why calling for jihad uh, wasn't an, an arrestable thing, wasn't a hate crime. Bear in mind, they'll jump on somebody who's retweeted a transphobic limerick, but calling for jihad, they're like, well, jihad has many meanings and can be interpreted in many ways. It's like, I don't oh. think it can be interpreted in that many ways in this context. They're like, oh, it can refer to an inner struggle. Like, these aren't people, like, calling for therapy to work on themselves, like, to battle like uh, some sort of unresolved ADHD or something like that. This is, you know, they're pretty explicit about calling for the, you know, extermination of Jews and the elimination of Israel. Mm. So, I, man, I'm not, I'm not Jewish or Israeli or Palestinian or anything. I mean, previously I've, I've gone on Palestinian marches in 2000, I think it was 2006, 2007, I think it was the siege of Lebanon. Um, I was trying to shag this Egyptian lassie. That's not the, the whole reason though. But, um, but yeah, we went on this one. But I've noticed since then the marches have, I mean, I haven't been on one as a sort of participant since then, but the marches that I've, I've walked through like yesterday and there's one in like 2021, I think it was, that I walked through, um, they've got a different ear. It's like a lot more uh, aggressive and quite a sort of darker, uh, darker tone to them. Mm. What'd you put that down to, that change? I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just the sort of uh, the empowerment that comes from sort of growing in numbers. And uh, and growing in the message, but I think it's also this acceptance by the by the uh, I hate to say woke people, but it is all these all these woke ideas that started on universities that you know critical race theory, decolonization. You know they all sounded like you know airy fairy mumbo jumbo sixth form student words. Um, and then I think it was a shock for a lot of people to see that this is what decolonization actually means is like killing civilians yeah and so that was a real wake-up call oh this isn't some dry academic uh debate this is you know people being killed over this there has to be a way i guess for people to to protest and, and say free palestine and all those things uh and for that to be acceptable though as well yeah yeah i mean like yeah mm. but, it's, but you can see in the protests I mean, you see in the foot, footage of the protests, it goes beyond that. It goes to, you know, glorying and, and Hamas's atrocities. Mm. It goes way beyond that. Some people are putting it down to the levels of immigration. Um, some people are saying that there are concerns. I know you're not supposed to ever say that around the word immigration. It's yeah. like, but always accept it, always more and more. But especially since leaving Europe, yeah. where, you know, where's the immigration coming from? Um, and that it's giving confidence to a growing number of people um and it does it does make it scary for, for jewish people my family's jewish and they're they're shitting themselves right now right yeah yeah and i've got jewish friends who are also you know worried i've got muslim friends who are yeah worried um because they can see you know how things how nasty things could could get but yeah i mean there's i think four million muslims or six million Mus muslims in the uk mm. um so it's a you know it's a Significant chunk. Yeah, there's a chunk in, I think, uh, 400,000 Jews or 300,000 Jews, something like that. So there's a big disproportion. Of it. Um, that goes for the, for the world as well. For some reason, uh, people see Muslims as a minority and there's like 2 billion Muslims. There's uh, 15 million Jews in the world. So, I mean, unless minority has changed all meaning completely, mm. um, you know, Muslims aren't the minority there. And also Islam is this colonizing force across the, not just the Middle East, but, you know, around the world, Southeast Asia, and now in Western Europe. And we're seeing it come to Western Europe and growing in numbers and the certain population growth amongst the Muslim population in Western Europe is outstripping 
by a significant margin, the sort of uh, the the population in the well, it's not a po- it's, it's a population decline in the sort of indigenous uh, Western European population. I know you're not allowed to say indigenous for some reason for right. uh, for people who aren't, um, you know, but white Westerners, white Westerners, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, do you think there's an aspect of the, and I was just discussing this with Remy, I don't know if that's going to come out after or before, but the bigotry of low expectations. So you talk of uh, it's parts of Islam as a, as a colonizing force and there are wealthy Islamic countries and so there should be. And they're constantly seen as the minority because it helps the Greta Thunbergs of this world to look down on them in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, yeah, that's because Israel is seen as I've seen Israel described as white adjacent. Yeah, which <laughs> like what what does that even mean? I mean, I think basically what people mean is uh, civilization yeah. versus you know sort of third world. Uh, yeah, or in the case of you know Hamas, just complete barbarianism. So I love the idea of Israel having like pronouns white adjacent. That's like it is Twitter. It's like white adjacent is how I uh, identify. <laughs> and but the real the real tragedy here is that a young autistic girl called a police officer a lesbian that's that's what's going on here did you see that story yeah yeah so this uh this autistic girl she's like 16 years old i think she had you know in town had some drinks and she was uh she somebody phoned the police to take her home and the police were taking her home and she mentioned that uh one of the police officers looked like her lesbian nana uh and her nana is a lesbian and this police officer is a lesbian as well i mean i'm not saying that all female police officers are, but you know, uh, this particular this one. particular one was. Uh, so the police officer saw this as a you know a total egregious hate crime, and uh, and they they detained. Well, they were they were in the process of detaining this girl. I don't know if she actually was carted off to the cells. I think she yeah. was. She was. Yeah, there was like seven cops or something. Yeah, yeah, and it's mad how I mean it shows the sort of the imbalance in policing, the sort of two tier criminal justice system we've got. It's like in the in the. Palestinian marches, the people who are being picked up and arrested and having flags taken off of them, we're, we're the people with the Union Jacks and the St. George Butts, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You're not allowed to, to wave them in, uh, in the country that they represent. I think, I think we've reached a point where identity now, it used to be, and the, the, so you can see how a country changes or, or a civilization changes based on their swear words, because those are the, the, the sacred words that nobody can say and it used yeah. to be religious words like hell and damn and then it became bodily words as we became like conservative about sex and things like that yeah. fuck and shit and stuff like that and now the identity words that's this phase we're going through yeah. so the fact that she said lesbian and the fact that again if you identify if you've got that British flag up you identify as something politically so these are identity things that you get carted off for jihad from what you're, so, you know, the, the, this out, that's that's trying to murder someone. Yeah. So that's not as serious as an identity related crime. So, <laughs> you know, identity is everything. But the funny thing is, lesbian. You know, we're, we're in an era now where you should be proud to be a lesbian. So yeah. It's so strange that she took it that way, as as if she'd called her an insult. Yeah. I mean, I guess historically it's been used pejoratively. So you know, I can understand it is a sort of protected characteristic. The trouble is the protected characteristics keep spreading and getting bigger and bigger. Like the Scottish hate crime bill introduces um, introduces like asexuals and monosexuals as protected characteristics. And they're not people who are discriminated against. Monosexual is somebody who's just a sex with themselves. Yeah. So in Scotland, you won't be able to call someone a wanker without committing a hate crime. <laughs> and asexuals are, you know, people who don't have any sex. And they're doing exactly what all sexually intolerant b- intolerant bigots have wanted people to do <laughs> forever. I think that I th- I think I saw you talk about this on Chris Williamson. I maybe uh, or it's something like that. And I started thinking, could asexuals be discriminated against? And I thought maybe if I'm just giving the benefit of the doubt, if you're at a swingers party, if you're at a swingers party, what are you going to do? No. Also, um, marriage. There's tax benefits, aren't there, to getting mm-hmm. married? So I figure. But I wish they would explain that. Like that's the reason asexuals are being discriminated against. Yeah. Because we don't want to marry anybody. And you don't get tax benefits and, and corporation, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, although they could still they could still marry. They could fall in love and get married and just not have sex. I forgot that, yeah. They should get married. Yeah, <laughs> just get married. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. Okay, and another, I guess another aspect here to talk about, and I, I've been, something I've been playing with in my mind as well, like you're supposed to be able to, attack someone's beliefs, aren't you? I saw somebody, I was Douglas Murray last night, I was just watching YouTube, he had this great thing about 
um, hardware and software. Right. And we've decided as a society that you're not supposed to mock someone's hardware. And I think that sounds reasonable. Your hardware being your looks, your body, your uh, immutable yeah, character. Exactly. Basically. And software are maybe your beliefs. And yeah. Things like that. You believe that whatever. And he said there is a real attempt. I mean, he was talking, I think, about gender dysphoria. So he was talking about there's an attempt to make your desires and wishes part or part of your hardware when some of these things, in his opinion, are part of your software. Yeah. With Islamophobia, there's a bit of a muddling, I think, with the hardware and software because your hardware isn't Islam. Your hardware is being Arabic or whatever particular race. There's loads of different races that I think that follow, yeah. follow Islam. With Judaism, it's more complicated because it's the same word, Jewish, for the sort of ethnicity and the belief system. Yeah, how does that how does that work? Because, you know, some people describe uh, Israel as an ethno-state. And I think also think it's harder to become a Jew. I think if you want to become a Muslim, uh, like Andrew T, just went, he just basically said, I'm a Muslim. I don't yeah. know if he put his, his hand on the Quran or however it works. Yeah. You just basically say you are. And then it's hard to move out of it if you, like, quit being a Muslim. Oh. Then you, you're an apostate, like, and that's bad. But uh, to be a Jew, one of my friends uh, converted to Judaism, and she had to go through a lot of um, a lot of stuff, a lot of training, yeah. and then pass tests. And uh, yeah, it was, it was very. We don't we don't want people in. We're quite <laughs> quite exclusive. <laughs> but it's a funny thing because I I don't. So I'm an atheist, so I don't even believe that stuff. So that stuff when they convert, I see those people as almost a different species. Right? Yeah. It's like you believe in all this stuff. Okay, you know, fire respect it. I tell and she she does the full. I mean, her husband's Jewish, and they do the full on like the dress. And she used to be like you know just a, a sort of regular uh, English lad. Yeah. And now they're dressed up like Little House in the Prairie and, you know, all full on. like Zeal of the like converts. converts. Yeah, yeah. They go, the converts go full whack. I know, I, I've got a friend uh, who, whose mother is also, yeah, converted. And they're like, you know, I used to call him on like, a Saturday, like, hey, mate, you want to go? And he'd be whispering into his phone because he's not allowed to talk <laughs> on, on Saturday. Yeah. And I'd be like, mate, you know, like, you know, God, if you believe, he can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> if you whisper or not, your parents can't, but he still follows that stuff. Even as, as, as an adult, he likes that stuff. Yeah. But, but that's the dip. So Jew, I feel I'm Jewish ethnically, I suppose, but I'm not Jewish religiously. Right. So I don't mind if somebody says to me, you know, the Torah is based on a bunch of lies. I'd be like, great, man, that's your belief. I know someone else has different belief. When they say you got a big nose because of whatever, that's that's when it's the, that's the hard yeah, one. and that's why I feel like with Islam you're not supposed to criticize the beliefs, and that's the difference, and that's yeah scary yeah yeah, and also the sort of the stakes are higher because you know there aren't that many sort of Church of England radicals who will like behead you if you criticize the Church of England yeah you know with Islam it's a it's a real it's a real danger. I don't even want to say, I'm happy you said it. I don't even want to say that. <laughs> it's a funny thing. People often say, why don't you do more about Islam? And I, and I don't. And I've done lots on Hasidic Judaism yeah. before people call me a hypocrite. I've done loads on the Jewish stuff. I've done loads of cult stuff on, on Christianity, Mormonism, and all those kinds of things. And I don't do Islam. And I say, well, it's obvious why I don't do Islam. But people think the reason is because I don't want to offend. Yeah. The reason is because I don't want to die. <laughs> like, I really don't. I'm scared shitless. And I'm, even now I'm thinking, okay, but I don't, I, I don't want to die. I'm saying I don't want to die. I don't. And I'm not going to say a bad thing about any of your, any of the teachings. Um, are you, I mean, look, you're a comedian. This is, this is what people talk about with comedy all the time at the moment, the censorship. Yeah. How, how do you, I mean, have you managed to find a way to be able to say what you want because of GB News, because of going outside of the mainstream? Yeah, I mean, uh, GB News is, uh, you know, is, is a great platform for uh, alternative viewpoints. Well, all viewpoints, you know what I mean? Because I think, I think the BBC regular channels just have the same sort of woke blob ideologies just repeated ad, ad hominem and even uh they they push some pretty poisonous ideologies like the the bbc news round cbbc website was uh was pushing the concept of white privilege as uh, as a scientific fact not as a not as a theory for children to discuss and look at whether it could be possible but as oh this is white privilege this is why white people definitely are more privileged you know like you could measure it in a beaker you know what i mean yeah. which is man that's that's dangerous stuff. gender identity as well yes yeah, stuff like that you know getting they won't call hamas terrorists yeah yeah exactly <laughs> exactly you know what i mean like they'll call for gb news to be to be shut down because uh because somebody makes a you know a, a, i mean an admittedly pretty pretty shagging nasty, shagging yeah comment about shagging. not wanting to sh shag a lassie 
Um, he shouldn't have said that. It was serious. He shouldn't have said it. But then you know, I felt like uh, I felt like the, the Hamas thing came along, and it really made me think, man. I wish I could go back to caring about stuff like that instead of stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I thought and a lot of the the thing with that Eva is it Richards or something? I can't remember Eva Santina. I can't remember what her name is. She'd said, is it, yeah, man. She'd said stuff. Um, with my, my mate Jeff Norcott on this politics show and she'd said some horrific stuff about uh, like Jeff uh, they, they were talking about male suicide which is a real I mean it's, I think it's the biggest killer of men um, who've got a gun in the house or whatever but like um, she Jeff Jeff was on there talking about how people deflect and minimise male suicide and uh, she immediately deflected and minimised male suicide and sort of made his point for him and was just throwing out all this weird stuff like you know Oh, what about, uh, you know, during COVID, women did more laundry and stuff like that. It's like, well, you know, that's bad as well. That's bad as well. But, you know, this is a this is a different thing. So I feel like, man, if Lawrence had played the ball, he would have, he could have completely, you know, eviscerated her and, and destroyed her argument. And instead he, you know, went for her with this, uh, you know, I wouldn't, who'd want to shag that? And it's like, obviously you would, Lawrence. I mean, like, she's not unattractive. I don't remember what she looks like. She's. She's quite, she's quite attractive. Yeah. So I felt like that was, I mean, it's, it's kind of sloppy and unprofessional and, you know, this is, this is the thing. I mean, I've got a love, a lot of love for Lawrence, but he was saying, you know, they, they've taken away my free speech and all this sort of stuff. It's like, no, when you signed a contract agreeing to abide by Ofcom regulations, you voluntarily signed that contract. So you took away your free speech. Mm. And if you want to say, if you want to be free and say other stuff, you can go and say it on Rumble. You can say it somewhere else. Like I'm sure I'll say stuff on this yeah. podcast that I, I wouldn't say on GB News or I wouldn't say in other uh, arenas. So yeah, that's 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 the difference. Yeah, he 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 did mess up there. It's a shame. There's also this thing. There's audience capture, and there's also a retaliation to the other side sometimes. And I felt when, and I, I know a lot of people have said this about Lauren Sparks, when he first sort of came into the public eye outside of acting, he was quite reason. He's made some very reasonable points. Yeah, that a lot of people went, oh, no one's really saying that. It's a little bit controversial about immigration and things like that. But he's he's got some sense here. Yeah, and and then he must get so much hate mail and so much shit from people. And this is what happened, I think, with Jordan Peterson, mm. who now I think is brilliant. In case he's listening, because I want to get him on the show, but does tweet some stuff that's a bit. Not the kind of thing you would expect him to say, maybe when he's yeah, thinking, yeah. or he just tweets his haiku stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> have you seen any of that? The haiku, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, okay. But but he, how many years has he had yeah. death threats of all sorts of mad stuff? And it really affected him. I mean, he was he was addicted to to painkillers and yeah. stuff. I think you got to be a certain kind of sociopath to not get affected by by. And it shows you know how human Jordan Peterson and Lawrence Fox are. That you know it does it does affect them. And yeah, I think it's a totally valid point. When he went on Question Time and originally said, you know, the, the points that he made, totally valid uh, opinions that I'm sure a lot of people, well, obviously a lot of people agreed with. And he was cancelled from his from his profession. It's, you know, disgusting to see. And then, you know, he, get, he gets repeated pylons. Yeah. And it's sort of pushing, it's alienating him and pushing him into a place where he his, his backlash to it is becoming, you know, becomes more vitriolic and becomes less... Uh, less pleasant, I guess. Mm. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, man, it's, it's it's sad to see. I thought, man, him getting cancelled, I and mean, it totally gets on my tits when people are like, "Oh, you're a terrible actor. Oh, you, you know, like you were, your career was was failing or whatever." No, he was making loads of money. He's been casting all kinds of stuff. He was in White Lines. He was doing all all these films, doing stuff on TV, and then that one thing like ended his career. And like, and it shows the the fear that all these people must live under. It's like living in the Soviet Union, where if you say the wrong thing, you know the the KGB are going to turn around and be like, "Oh, you need to go to re-education camp for twelve years, and you'll never be seen again." You know? Yeah, and we all criticise China for the social scores that they have over there. Yeah, at least they know what the what you do. Like, at least living under the Soviet Union, you knew criticising the state would get you in the gulag. Like in in Britain, you're not sure what. What you what you're gonna say is is gonna is gonna get you uh, yeah. cancelled. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've been noticing that more and more. This kind of we we criticise China so much for like the social system and all that social points and things. When I was in America with the tipping, right? Yeah, everyone who talks to you is trying to get money out of you. Yeah, it's the weirdest feeling. And so you you're very aware suddenly that you're trading social niceness for right. money. Yeah. 
that's a weird that's a weird thing and yeah. we do it here with tips as well and money and things like that and now we're just so used to saying the right thing and then you get put in a good place that i guess that's a very human thing yeah are you are you also the thing is sort of it's sort of hacking the social social contract a bit because i mean i noticed like walking down the street you see these chuggers and they come and stop and they're all like smiling and being friendly like the charity muggers oh right they so they, they stop you and they're they're like uh they're like hey do you have time to talk and it's like they're being nice but then, because you know they're trying to get money off you, yeah. you're like, no. And then, when somebody's genuinely being nice, you're like, you're offish, you're standoffish with them. So they're breaking that that fabric in society, I think, mm. uh, by raising money for guide dogs. <laughs> God, <it's>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like that. Like, it's like when you get the, you know, the, the uh, social marketing things like Herbalife or whatever. Yeah. So I remember uh, me and some mates went out for dinner, and the next, the next day, this guy who was there, I hadn't seen him, seen him in ages. He phones me up and I'm like, oh man, he's a comedian, right? Comedian and actor. So I was like, he must have a job for me or he must just want to chat. I'm like, oh, brilliant. How's it going? And straight away he's talking about, have you ever thought about buying your own helicopter, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what's he talking about? Then he, he's talking about Herbalife. Yeah. He like phoned me up to sell me Herbalife. And I'm like, man, you son of a bitch. You know had, what I mean? Had you just so, been renting helicopters up to that point? <laughs> 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 but it, like you know broke the sort of the, the fabric of friendship a bit shit man. that like, does I've got fucking phone me up and try and sell me Herbalife well this is it I mean now, you just spoke to the heart of my, my channel because you know I'm trying to branch out a bit because the cults 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 and it's like three times a week for three years I think my audience and me are going okay let's split this up a little bit and yeah. that's why we're doing some battle of ideas stuff and coming back into this stuff uh, but the Herbalife stuff, I mean, that's a cult and it's multi-level marketing. Yeah, and, yeah. And you're right, yeah, it's, it's another example of this sort of social contract where he'll be really nice to you. A friend of mine had that recently, so he just couldn't believe it. An old friend from school suddenly messaging, yeah, oh, good, good to talk to you. Have you heard about helicopters or whatever, whatever it was? <laughs> Leo Curse has a wonderful helicopter and you can have a nice one too. Unbelievable that that's where people will go. And I, I just think that's, that, that says a lot about the human mind, really, just, just the places we'll go yeah. to... to try and get money from people and stay yeah 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 and also the i mean the the sort of toxicity that's going to have on an entire social network yeah around that person do you get a lot of hatred do you get stuff from people online and how does it make you feel uh not really i mean i get some on twitter but t twitter's not real life you've really got to like see it as you know some sort of uh some sort of circus sometimes it you know it annoys me um, but generally, I either just block them, or I laugh at them, or I engage with them uh, and wind them up. Um, same with same with YouTube comments. Get YouTube comments on my on my videos. Uh, but yeah, like it's just you got to sort of see it as a as separate to to yourself, the the person, if you know what I mean. And like, man, none of these people on Twitter, none of them will come up to you and say it to your face. You know what I mean? It's like if anybody actually had any balls, they'd say it to, especially a comedian. It's easy to find a comedian. I probably shouldn't be giving people like, yeah, I'm wondering where you're going with this because I'm thinking of Salman Rushdie and I just want everyone to remember the Scottish accent is Leo and and not me and that's who you should be after. Well, if bear in mind, I've never, I haven't written any like book of verses that you know can be can be deemed Islamophobic. Actually, you know, you know what, uh, that book it wasn't actually Islamophobic. It's just like one guy somewhere decided. <laughs> It was Islamophobic, and then it became, you know, everyone's like, oh my God, this must be Islamophobic. Like, one guy somewhere, I swear to God, one guy decided, and had, then, like, the have, Ayatollah, who's all like, yeah, no, let's get this, this, it had a, this one. It had a scene of Muhammad going, and I am saying this is what he wrote, and I am not saying he did that, that this is true, but he wrote Salman Rushdie, very awfully what he did. He wrote a scene of uh, Muhammad going behind the bushes and sort of, pretending it's spoken to God and coming back and saying, these are the rules, I can have loads of wives and I can do these kinds of things. And I think that's what people are pissed off with. He had one scene that was Islamophobic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what though, outside of that scene, which I was disgusted by, it's one of the best books of all time. Really? It's phenomenal. I read it when I was, yeah, I, I would never read it now because I'm 34 and I don't have patience and I, I just, yeah. I would rather just watch The Simpsons and just look forward to dying in 30 years. But, when I was, you know, when you're 19, you're like pretentious, right? Everyone who's not pretentious at 19 says, so you see, oh, standing verses, I'll read that yeah. in public. Everyone, look at that. Yeah. And that, uh, forget that scene because that's not what most of the book's about. Yeah. It's just, I don't know how he, the guy, the guy's brain is like on a different planet. But it, is it an actual like good book to read? Because so many of these good books, like, uh, like the Gulag Archipelago is uh, an incredible book and a really sort of essential reading to find out, you know, how 
authoritarian societies work and you know tie in with you know everybody and how everybody responds to them and stuff but man it's it's hard going yeah. reading it and i know it's translated from russian but still i'm like man a lot of this could have been summarized like yeah. you could you could have done this in bullet points some some in russia is the same i wouldn't read that now because oh, i just i don't have the energy i don't have the mental right. capacity but when you're 19 i was watching that art nouveau fag french shit and pretend telling myself i enjoyed that for some black and white <laughs> trufo of like a kid running for like five hours for uh, what am i enjoying yes i'm enjoying this and, and I'll, afterwards I'll, I'll wash that out with a bit of wash it down with some salmon rush tea but yeah not fun to, you know, the good one to read with with regards to that is um crime and punishment dostoevsky right. because it's secretly actually a page turner that's really easy to read right and then you get to tell everyone you read dostoevsky yeah yeah that one is just like bam 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 you're like reading a modern uh, great book like so jackie collins yeah that's what it felt like that's yeah. what it felt <laughs> whereas rushity was like oh bloody hell I tolstoy oh this is boring dostoevsky not the brothers karamazov i started that recently I had to stop after about a page because it was too I can't, maybe i'm getting older is I don't. that turgenev or some someone is that what turgenev What's, oh, oh no, it's also Dostoevsky. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I haven't even heard of that other Russian person. Right. And uh, but but this is the podcast. You know, you're getting Russian names on this podcast. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, isn't Boris. it? <laughs> what was that? Boris. Boris. Another one. We, Boris is joining your oh yeah TV Boris channel. TV. Boris Johnson. Yeah, yeah. And I'm surprised. I thought everyone would be happy. Uh, maybe I'm just too much of an optimist. But like, I thought, oh, this is great. Boris is joining. He's really funny. He's a natural born entertainer. Kind of like less diligent when it comes to being a prime minister but you know in terms of like sheer entertainment value and charisma and stuff man he's he's got it um and yeah I tweeted and then all these like people were commenting underneath being all like oh yeah but he put us through lockdowns and stuff and it's like man it wasn't boris's fault boris's natural libertarian instincts were to the not of lockdowns but you're surrounded by all these like tall pussies yeah and also people who saw an opportunity to juice money out the system, like man, those COVID contracts were just—you can always see the moment that the the real the politicians realised they could make money by like giving all their mates COVID contracts and taking backhanders, and you know the dollar signs went up, and then it was like, yes, we're locking down, we're locking down hard. Do you think that was it? Yeah, conspiracies. Don't get my YouTube channel taken down. It's not even a conspiracy. Like, look at look at Michelle Moore. Look at uh, what's his name? Is it Owen um, the Randox guy? Don't know. Uh, I can't remember. Is that shampoo? Name. Uh, uh, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so they do, they do all the, you know, COVID testing and stuff. Yes, like yes, yes. Getting all, like, a, getting all these consultancy fees or just, you know, money from Randox, but he's, you know, an, an MP. He had to resign over it. In fact, that was one of the things that brought Boris down because Boris tried to protect him. I wish I could remember the guy's name. I'm sure yeah. it was Owen something. Some Randox. Randox. I don't know. Yeah, well, but, look, but Boris is also a bit of a compulsive liar. He did apparently with the Brexit thing. He wrote an article for him and against, didn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. Got, so he's an opportunist. For GB News, though, I think that's a huge coup, especially after what's just happened. There's been a lot of controversy, which we can't go into. Don't want to get you in trouble with your with those people, with your employers, I suppose. I've been on a couple of times as well. Um, the Hunter Biden laptop story is interesting, uh, if only because I'm often looking at like left lefty censorship, but there's some righty censorship. And I think the perfect example is Sam Harris, who said on trigonometry that anything that comes out of the Hunter Biden laptop stuff, for anyone who doesn't know, that's, that's Biden, President Biden's son. And apparently on his laptop, there's lots of naked photos and things that shouldn't be there and horrible things. And um, I mean, it's, like there's there's stuff. I think there was evidence of uh, of prostitution and possibly prostitution using federal funds, which is a tall wow, tall crime. Like this uh, uh, sort of people trafficking. Uh, wow. But how does he? Is he a politician as well? Hunter Biden's a lawyer, um, and he was getting paid fifty thousand dollars a month. Uh, by a Ukrainian energy company, but it's obviously just buying access to, you know, political influence. Wow. That's quite scary. But look, oh man, the stuff that's coming out of the House Oversight Committee. So the the Republican House Oversight Committee has been and this this is like a proper thing. This isn't like, you know, uh, some, you know, conspiracy theory website. This is this is the actual political establishment in the US. Uh, under James Comer have been investigating the Biden family and they've found like just and they've got the evidence of like wire transfers of millions of dollars from Romania from China uh, to to Biden family members God. for for no product or service it's all you know money why is that money being transferred it's and I think under any other situation Biden would be the one we'd all be talking about but because the establishment is so afraid of Trump getting back in uh they're just 
ignoring that even harder than they ignored the the, the laptops because it's extraordinary there's 330 million people there in america it's, yeah. it's one of the most successful countries in the world full of some of the biggest brains in the world and yeah. those are the two people we've ended like, two <laughs> absolutely corrupt unintelligible as funny as trump is just yeah. off on tangents don't really say it he doesn't say anything yeah. Biden, i'm i'm flabbergasted because I found the jokes, constant jokes about his age, I find them boring just because they're boring jokes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's old. Yeah, we get it. But then you watch him talk, and it's like, it's wow, yeah. That's he, the president. And he's had such a distinguished career. And he's, you know, he's being, and also, you know, he's actually performing kind of okay. You know, especially when you look at something like Israel, mm. you know, that could have that could have flared up into a much wider conflict, but he's managed to, you know, just put all the pressure in the right places to stop it. You know, that, I mean, I'm saying that, I'm probably coming out of this, interview we'll find out that world war three's kicked off but yeah. uh but yeah i mean is it is a shame that they didn't have the balls to just put somebody young and um you know like a like an obama type yeah uh, people like to but i know i know the in youtube doesn't youtube people are going, yeah what do you mean his wife's a trans all sorts of mad stuff but I, I he was just great i like him that's the one thing i couldn't believe She's like, don't, don't, don't go, the no Lawrence Fox things here. You're not on GB News, so you're not on TV, so I suppose it's fine. But, but that, that's a big thing people believe. Yeah. I don't want to repeat it too much. There's so many things. I get, I get anger all the time that I don't report that Meghan Markle faked her baby. Like, that, that I've, I'm almost getting death threats from people because I'm not going to report that because I don't have enough evidence. And they're like, I've shown you the evidence. Just saying this now, I'm going to get a whole bunch more of that now. I don't know why I've done that. But just people get into these, you know, these things. Yeah. Obama's good. Well, but what I was going to say was, yeah, Sam Harris. I think that's an example. You know, I think he said a, probably a stupid thing because he was saying that it doesn't. He, he doesn't care that that the Democratic influence is is trying to sort of push that story down about Biden and Biden, yeah. Biden laptop because it's more important that um, Trump not get back in. Yeah, but that's such an anti-democratic yeah thing to see. That's a terrifying it thing is. to see. But you know, it's it's been going for fifteen years. He said a really stupid thing i think i think he's backed down a bit on that yeah yeah but he's that's it i think sam harris on on the sort of center right is gone right was he i mean was he right wing he was sort of sam harris very centrist again i'd love to have him on my one i do he's he's very straight and it's it's like it's it's not as fun as listening to a jordan peterson he's right, yeah very very straight and and people are listening for like three hours to like intellectual and did, did he lose, like, uh, was he fired from a position? Was he with, like, Daily? No, because he's, he's independent. He was, like, independent. Well, he's his independent. own thing. But, and what if people just stop listening to He's a bad name now on, like, yeah. YouTube. You can't, you say the word Sam Harris, he's, like, gone. And, like, the left disowned him anyway because he said things like, Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. Right, yeah. So he's he's got a very narrow space. Of See that if you're living somewhere like America where there's uh, very few Muslims and the ones that are there tend to be well integrated. Yeah. Is that is that right? Yep. <laughs> Bloody hell! Um, no, you know what? Another point about it. the one thing I think I think GB News did badly actually. It did, it did it at the beginning, so maybe they wouldn't now. Was it's the free speech channel? Do you remember that fella did that? When you told Harry, was that he took the knee? Took the knee, yeah. And I thought I think taking the knee in the UK because it's not. I, I don't see what that's about. But I thought the whole point is you're supposed to allow plurality, plurality of opinion. You should be allowed to do it. And everyone went mental. Yeah, I mean that was before my time. So actually, I genuinely don't know much about that, which is handy. Because, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to comment on it. <laughs> You've got your job to protect. I get yeah, that. Yeah. Tell me about Dan Woods. No, but like, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, good to Harry taking the knee. I think at that time, taking the knee was quite, a uh, quite a specific, uh, statement. So it'd be like coming out with, uh, you know, an, an ISIS flag or something like that. Mm. Um, and I think we've seen since then, you know, taking the knee, um, but I guess people thought at the time, well, we're standing up for, for racial equality. It's like, no, you're not. Look, all the BLM chapters are coming out and like supporting Hamas. And uh, and also all the money that went to BLM, it's just gone to some grifters to buy mansions. It's like, that money's like, man, thank God it went to those people to have a good time. Because, you know, otherwise it would have been spent on like trying to do good. Whenever people try to do good, it's horrible. Look at the history of socialism, for an example. But um, yeah, so I'm glad. I'm glad some people, you know, just had a party and like it went yeah. and always, and they got a nice fella out of it. Yeah, well, some yeah, people got to live, don't they? But you know, I I agree with you on that. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, and I think you agree. You should be able to say his opinion. Yeah, you should be able to like take the knee. I don't really see what the what the fuss is about. 
Uh, it was a bit of an own goal, I thought, GB. Uh, before your time, I'm not, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm blaming you. <laughs> you know, I don't think you were making fun. There was other stuff going on because I know, you know, certainly around, you know, um, like like Lawrence Fox, Calvin Robinson, um, you know, people are like, oh, he got fired for this reason because he spoke it because he was, you know, uh, doing this. It's like not like quite often. It's just a simple, you know, breach of contract or something like that that interests yeah. people get people get fired for, and no doubt. It's going to happen to me someday. Like, nobody's immune from that's the trouble when you're, like, especially being a comedian, it's very hard to stay within contractual boundaries. Yes. Um, you're not supposed to almost, you know, you should, you're supposed to be a comedian. It's like Seinfeld always said, like, award ceremonies for comedians is the most ridiculous thing. You're not supposed to stick to the rules and be worshipped by the mainstream group. Like, you're supposed to be the outsider. Yeah, yeah. And who's that guy who presents, um, uh, fam not Family Fortunes, is it Family Fortunes in America? Steve, Steve Harley? Is it Steve Harley? Yes. But, um, so he was, he was a comedian and he was, is it Steve Harley? I can't see sure. Is he black? Black guy, yeah, yeah. I think that's him. Yeah, yeah. So Steve Harley, he was a comedian, amazing comedian, really good mm -hmm. comedian. And now he presents uh, Family Fortunes or Squares or whatever it is. Um, and somebody, like the, the cameras and everything went down. So he had to do stand up for 20 minutes. He was killing it in the, in the room. And somebody said to him afterwards, man, why do you do stand up anymore? Why do you tour? What, you know, you're so funny. And he says, look, I'm doing this job presenting family fortunes. I love it. If I do stand up at some point, somebody's going to get offended by something that I say. And that's this job gone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you offended somebody that non Brits might not know, but Victoria Corrin Mitchell, who is a, 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 an intellect, I suppose, a comedian intellect. So I, I think, you know, she's good. It's, it's a bit highbrow for me. A lot of us, I can't, I can't follow. Yeah. I love David Mitchell. Um, but oh, she's married to David Mitchell. That's, yeah, that's where the Mitchells come in. And, yeah. But, uh, but I think, I think he's hilarious, but, but that does that hurt sometimes? Cause then do, do you watch like, would I lie to you? And it's like, oh, those are the sort of squeaky clean good guys and I can't I'm not going to get an invitation now I'm never going to get an invitation to some like would I lie to you or something like that but I don't I don't want to dress up as a sailor in a sailor suit and like fucking try and chuck bananas through a donut you know what I mean all this stupid stuff they do in these stupid games it's quite fun it's, though no it's not man the, the, have you watched it no. Ah, <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. I knew it. But all this, ma all this like mainstream comedy is always like just some demeaning. You're dressed up as a duck. You know what I mean? Somebody's squirting hot tea up your ass. It's like it's not. That's in hot. You wouldn't get Chris Rock doing that. You wouldn't get Bill Burr doing that. You know what I mean? But I, f no. I find with the uh, with Victoria. So Victoria Cora Mitchell accused me of being racist, right? And like something like that would sting if it was in any way accurate or or defendable as a as a as a position. She was completely wrong. Like I said, basically we're talking talking about that Nazanin Zagari Markle or whatever she's called, mm. like the woman who like we paid half a billion dollars to uh, Iran to get her back from Iran, and she comes out and she's all like, uh, bear in mind she's been locked up by Iran and like she's Iranian or whatever. She's been locked up by Iran and she's all like, oh the British government because obviously she can't slag off the Iranian government because she's only like to slag off Britain. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like when, when she got out, I was, I was reading the story out in GB News and I was like, so uh, Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe, uh, and I was like, which is Iranian for ungrateful and might not seem it now. That was a really funny line. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't laugh now because I've heard it before. Yeah, that's why. And not, but I mean, it's, it's a fu funny line. People are like, oh, but the, the, the language they're speaking around is Farsi. And it's like, obviously I'm not, my best mate Darius, he's Iranian. Like, I know that they speak Farsi in Iran. They actually speak lots of languages in Iran, not just Farsi. So, I mean, it wouldn't have been completely accurate to assume that she speaks Farsi. But if you're, if you're doing, if you're being funny, you're sort of inhabiting a persona. This sort of boorish, like Bill Burr does, this sort of barroom drunk yeah. who's saying the, you know, terrible things that have, you know, it's, it's a personal truth rather than objective truth. So by saying, like, she is Iranian, it's like, I'm being deliberately obtuse and dumb and call it yeah. Iranian instead of Farsi. It makes it funnier. And that's just how comedy works. Victoria Cora Mitchell wouldn't know that because she's a Nepal baby who, you know, she, she's, man, she's not that funny. Like, yeah. even for a woman, she's just not that funny. And she just, <laughs> she came out, uh, this, I said, this thing with Jimmy News, the game is so racist. Slip. Man, I wasn't, I knew straight away, I wasn't being racist. Yeah. And like, I'm the one in the defensible position. I can prove that I wasn't being racist. I can show I'm not being racist. She immediately knew she had nothing. So she wrote out these pages and pages and pages trying to explain how I was racist without ever explaining why I was racist, hoping people would just get bored. 
before she got to the end of her, you know, 500 tweets, like, and assumed that, you know, the, the 500th one had the magic key that explained why I was racist. So yeah, she totally flopped and failed on that one. I suppose. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted I'll never, I'll never be asked to do comedy in the BBC. You know what I mean? Cause like, man, you know, I watched that stuff and it's dismal. It's where comedy goes to die. And you got all these comedians now who are still chasing that dream. They're like, I want to get on the BBC. I want to do Mog the Week. I want to do, have I got news for you? I can't do anything else because, oh, then they might think that I'm, I'm right wing or I'm not, mm-hmm. don't have the right opinions to do Mog the Week. It's like, man, I think Mog the Week's been cancelled. It doesn't even exist. You're chasing a dream. You're chasing a business model that doesn't exist. Even if it hadn't been cancelled, it's what, like a grand, a grand and a half a pop? It's like, you're not going to, you're not going to get a mortgage mm. off that. The problem is, though, there's not there aren't many alternatives. GB News is here now. It wasn't a couple of years yeah. ago. Uh, talk TV is another one, but there's not really much comedy, as far as I know. There's not really comedy on GB News. No, I did, I did pilots uh, for, with Talk TV to do a, a, oh. a comedy sort of news show. And, man, they had a lot of money. Um, and they had Marcus Brigstock on it. And it's funny, you get these people like, you know, um, like uh, that the maybe would be like, oh, I'm not going to do... Uh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that because I might be perceived as right wing. But like when it's a, a Murdoch thing, because they know that like there's there's points of money there, they're happy to. Yeah, I'll I'll be I'll go and I'll go and talk radio, or talk TV, and and mm-hmm. do all that. Like Dang. principles seem to seem to evaporate and uh, very soluble in money. The relationship between this, this is what we were talking about before. I suppose it's a theme of this episode: the relationship between money and and your principles. Yeah, I think it's fine to sell out a bit. And just be honest about it. Yeah, that's what it is. I think, and I think everyone's fine with that. People are fine with that. No one minded the Queen having loads of money. No one minds Prince William having loads of money. People mind Meghan and Harry having loads of money because they don't stop whinging about how different yeah, they are yeah. and how great they are and how wonderful yeah, they are. Virtuous. Yeah, that's what it yeah. is. Flying to another climate change summit. It's being virtuous gets you points, but you got to be careful because yeah. then, then if there's any hypocrisies, you're out. Well, this is the thing. So much of the virtue is just completely. Uh, false, like Gary Lineker, for example. Mm. You know, he, looking at his, his Twitter, you think, "What? Oh, what a great guy!" He's like, you know, standing in the streets, battling for rights for everybody. And no, like he uh, he does all the the tweeting against the government. Um, he used that as a as a defence in his court case over unpaid tax. So he owed HMRC yeah. four point nine million pounds. <laughs> wow! And uh, they said, "Look, you're an employee of the BBC, so you should be taxed as an employee." And he said, no, look, I'm an independent person. This is just part of the, the stuff that I do. I do all this political activism on Twitter as well. So look at all my, my tweets, you know, slagging off the government. And that's that's what he used to, and he successfully got out of a tax bill. Wow. And man, that's money. There he is. If he actually was virtuous, he'd give that money. He'd willingly, he'd happily give that money to the government so they could buy kidney dialysis machines and, you know, help save sick kids and stuff. Again, I don't, I don't blame him for doing the tax thing. I do. <laughs> I know. I, f- I think. Look, if, if you want, if you want to make more money, make more money. I don't blame. At me. least be open about. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, I don't blame that. I, it's just, if you're going to be virtuous about. If you're going to, if you're going to lecture everyone, that's when there's yeah. going to be scrutiny. Yeah. Because if he's earning enough that he's got five million tax bill, but that's only the bit he didn't pay. Presumably, he did pay at least quite a few million. Yeah. That's a lot. I mean, this. Day, how can he lecture the rest of us about this? And I made a documentary for the BBC that I sold to them about exorcism when I saw an exorcism. We had to make it first because they wouldn't even look at me beforehand. Right. They wouldn't, you know, and, and I, well, I've got reasons to believe there were suspicious reasons about that, but sold it to them eventually, right? I, and me and my friend David basically made the whole documentary, just me, just the two of us, right? Documentary usually goes, you know, they pay a hundred grand for, to make a document, maybe more for a lot of documentaries. They gave us for the entire thing, just me and him, six grand right and that but then they made us do loads of changes we had to pay lawyers and stuff which cost eight grand Jeez. so we made the whole document it wasn't just i presented i did a presenting gig we made the whole thing yeah. we lost two grand doing Jeez. it of our own money yeah, and yeah. they basically said to us when we tried to push back like well come on this isn't we, you're supposed to be pushing people up well, this is our first chance we're young we're trying to do this yeah, yeah. this is your whole thing bbc they were just like look it's on the table is that or you're out and we were like we were desperate Jeez. you know yeah, we spent yeah. two years on LinkedIn trying to like, get any email address. We're emailing the receptionist going, please look at this this documentary. Yeah. So we're like, uh, uh, okay, we're going to have to try and get the money from like, who's got two grand? We didn't have two grand to pay the lawyer. So yeah. what's that money? And then you look at Lineker, who's got enough just for once a week popping up, you know, talking about football. He's very good at his job. Yeah. But it does, you do start to resent things. I oh, suppose, yeah. I suppose that's another, this is another point. I mean, Carol Vorderman, she's always she's just using her status as a trusted mathematician to flog dodgy loans to confused old people. And then she's all like, oh, I'm such a virtuous person. You're the government so bad. Oh, we should, we should have open borders. Open borders, guys. The immigration virtue signal has got to be the easiest 
laziest virtue signal because you know there's other people they're going to make some difficult decisions and keep you know keep you safe and also if you're Gary Lineker if you're you know Carol Vorderman like man you got you got a big house with the front door of the locks Prince Charles King Charles whatever we call him now yep. man I went I went to where he lives Clarence House armed guards with machine guns it's like he doesn't need to worry about you know anybody like trying to break into his house or anything yeah. like that I remember being and I'm so ashamed of this when I was 20 or 21 because I was a bit I, I was never woke I was never like but I, I had those kind of opinions you know immigration and I, I lived in different countries so yeah. I was going to be an immigrant in, in a way but whatever we call us expats though when you're middle class and you move we're an expat and yeah. immigrants so, but, but fine and I remember sharing a tweet that I thought was really like this is I'm such a great guy and it was this meme that was um, if somebody who doesn't even speak your language and has never been and blah 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 can come here and take your job what does that say about you and I thought that was a really virtuous thing to, to yeah, tweet yeah. or whatever. And only looking back later did I go, my God, I was a monster. <laughs> what a monster I was. But you don't see it at the time, you know? Yeah. It's such a hard thing. Like, to, the way I spoke, because I didn't have those concerns. I grew up middle class. I had a good education. I don't have to worry about somebody coming over and stealing my job. Yeah, and it's like that with a lot of sort of ideologies. So, I mean, for example, the sexual liberation of the 60s, uh, middle class people really benefited from that because, you know, you'd have the freedom to go and, you know, have different partners or live whatever life you wanted to, to have divorce your, your folks. But, you know, for working class people, it means a lot of working class kids are now growing up without a dad. We've, we've wrecked that sort of, um, this sort of social structure that held mm -hmm. everything together. And yeah, it's, it's bad for, it's bad for kids. I mean, it's like, I think only 23% of, uh, of, uh, black kids in America grow up with a with a dad now, and that's man, that's that's a that's a real worry, and it's it's going to be you know it's similar um, similar stats for for working class white kids as well. Yeah, they're doing really badly. Yeah, yeah, they're, it's a strange thing. I, I looked at it recently, like uh, how how minorities are doing, and you've got right at the bottom for like the free school meals schools, those are the poorest schools in the country. You've got the white kids; they're right at the bottom. Yeah, um, and and black Caribbean kids as well are quite low down yeah but high up is black african kids yeah and in people of indian origin those kinds of what the what is going what's going i don't even know what that's about well then with the with black african um uh immigrants the they tend to be um coming as sort of higher level immigrants if you know what i mean mm -hmm. like as doctors and stuff like that also they've got a strong sort of christian christian base and they haven't had their family sort of uprooted taken to the Caribbean for a few hundred years and then brought back. So oh, well, that, those, that sort of social uh, disharmony does echo through the, even though, you know, I, I, I totally disavow critical race theory and stuff. There's, there's definitely some, some horrible things that happened through slavery and all the rest of it that, mm. that are still echoing through the, the generations now. Culture and, and history uh, being a part of it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing at the moment? You got have you got stuff out? Where should we send people to look at your uh, Willie? No, look at your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> My only fans, uh, man. I wonder, like, because that's that's one of the ways men are discriminated against. Like, if I if I start an only fans, I don't think like just some some guy twanging his like you know middle aged testicles on a webcam. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna pay for that. No, no one would. But what's the website anyway? So I can <laughs> for this testicle thing. But that, 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 I just want to point on that because. Somebody shared with me this morning uh, some like cult thing that I should look into. It was right. a weird cult where they were doing weird things to be. They were forcing people to get the trans things happen to them. And it's like, it's a religious cult. It's a weird thing. And uh, the woman who was doing the YouTube about it, uh, after one minute in, did an advert for a vibrator. <laughs> and somebody did say underneath, when, when it, the person underneath, when they were suggesting it to me, said like, hang on, there's a bit. Did you see that she's done that ad? Imagine if it was a bloke doing that. Like one minute into my cult thing, going like, by the way, I use this uh, thing. Like, yeah. yeah, I've just <laughs> just been using that and had a wonderful time, everybody. But please enjoy the rest of this video about this cult. Like, <laughs> I'd be even for YouTube, I'd be cancelled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, me, a sexual liberation, and then there's like the dangly balls thing you described <laughs> that you'll share the website with me later. <laughs> but yeah, go. On, what were you saying? Yeah, so I've got I've got a YouTube channel, um, and I've got I've got a Patreon where I do I do Patreon only live streams and stuff that you know I can't put on youtube um so yeah that's that's pretty much it i know i'm on gb news headliners a lot of nights that's what it is that's, that's what it's about everybody go and follow leo curse on the youtube on the things on the gb news we'll put all the links below he's given up his time to be here he's been fantastic i think and you think as well keep on watching this channel hit the like button 
and watch this similar things that I'm going to put here. Keep on watching this. <laughs>